I'm Sam Caligioni of Dogfish Head Craft Brewery, and you're fortunate enough to be listening to the True Philadelphia Podcast with Matt O'Donnell. Darn right. (laughs) Good stuff. Hey, everyone. I'm Matt O'Donnell. If you know craft beer, no matter where you live in the country, you probably have heard of the Dogfish Head Craft Brewery in Delaware. And if you know Dogfish Head, you probably have heard of its highly charismatic founder and president, Sam Caligioni. What you may not know is that Sam's wife, Mariah, has been his closest business partner all along. She serves as vice president of the company and handles marketing and social media. The Caligionis were in Philadelphia for a business meeting. I met Sam in the lobby of their hotel for this podcast one morning. He led me to his hotel room, a suite, and there was his wife. So I decided to include both of them in this podcast because... You know what? Not all husband-wife partnerships work as successfully as theirs has. Dogfish Head Crab Brewery's Sam Caligioni and Mariah Caligioni on the True Philadelphia Podcast right now. I am here with Sam Caligioni and his wife, Mariah. We are in a hotel room. They're sweet at the Philadelphia Marriott because they're in Philadelphia for a strategy meeting. Yeah, every dogfish sales co-worker has flown from across the country. We're fortunate enough to have about 85, 90 salespeople across America. And we flew them all into the city of brotherly love. And we're hitting a lot of accounts and saying thanks to the local Philadelphia market while we talk about our strategy for the year. This is a partnership, husband and wife. Dogfish Head. What is your exact positions? Uh, I'm the boss. Mariah is just the decision maker. Is that true? <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into it. You, Sam, uh, along with Mariah, you founded one of the most popular craft breweries in America. You doubled your growth multiple times. You expanded into spirits. You've done reality TV. You open your own hotel. You make soap out of beer. So... To open things up, how do you chill out? How do we chill out? Um, don't give the obvious answer. Like know, what? Like a brew, you know? Right. Like no, I won't talk about work stuff. I would say my biggest luxury that I make sure I do every day is I either go for a paddleboard down in coastal Delaware or, or a bike ride. I make sure I fit that in every day so I earn uh, my beers. And uh, like you, I do a ton of reading, a little bit of writing, but a lot of reading. Mariah, what about you? How do you chillax? Chillax. I like to take a spinning class every couple, couple times a week and um, sit around and read magazines. I love reading magazines, like like paper magazines, not online. She's old school, man. These are people things. Yeah, <laughs> like People Magazine. Yes. People yeah. mag- are there any moments where you're just simply overwhelmed by what you're doing? Uh, maybe not overwhelmed for for me like an event like this where we get to see sales co-workers that we work full-time at our company but we only see one time a year it's pretty surreal to know that a company we own has these folks in seattle and austin and chicago working their butts off every day on behalf of dogfish um and it's but it's more of a, a humbling thing than it is overwhelming when you when we think about it how lucky we are that our company got to the scale it is it's because of the people that we we work with that it got this big it's probably bigger than what our imagination was when we opened it. I don't know what you'd add to that. It's so big that you are the second most popular Mariah in the world. (laughs) (laughs) Well, until the other one came onto the scene, no one knew how to say my name, so that's that's okay. (laughs) Well, you know, I was going to ask this later on, but I'm lucky to have Mariah here, too. I I wasn't expecting her to be here, but I want to talk about what it is like running a company as a husband and wife. I'm sure there are a variety of things. There are good times and bad times and sort of neutral times. What's it like? Uh, we, we, our cubicles are literally next to each other, and we joke that the panel between us is bulletproof glass. <laughs> and there, it's great because, Mariah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I like to come up with recipes, concepts or events, marketing things, and, and she's the best filter to be like, your four, four of the five things you said are totally stupid. That, but that fifth one, maybe work on that one more. That one's not as stupid as the other ideas. And that, so critical to the creative gestation process, I would say, for, for Mariah. And she's sort of the, the digital voice of our, 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 our brand and really got our social media uh, going. Uh, it's, it's great working together. I, we do notice that if I don't go on some business trips with frequency, um, when I'm home too often, I would say there's a ratio, right, Mariah? <laughs> there's a ratio. It's not, it sounds like you provide a lot of honesty. For Sam's work. 
Yes. And, and, you know, when you work at a company where, you know, he's the leader of the company, um, many people in the company aren't going to give him honest feedback necessarily, even if he asks for it. And, you know, the same. So we, we do that for each other. Um, but, it, you know, we've worked together since we opened the company and that we were 26 years old. So it's not like we had other careers and suddenly we started working. It's just always been that way. So, um, you know, we focus in different areas and um, just give each other our space at work, um, just naturally. Have we hit peak craft beer? Um, I don't think so. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a tumultuous competitive industry. It's fun, you know, because the craft brewing brethren, as, as uh, ubiquitous as craft breweries seem in America, it's still only about 13% market share. And we're still up against two, you know, conglomerates, foreign-owned conglomerates that control the majority of America's beer market. InBev, Molson Coors. Exactly. And, and, you don't uh, like to mention them by name. <laughs> you just gave him a free ad, Matt. It's like we'll bleep that out. <laughs> don't say Voldemort, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I, my best, my buddies, Tom Keogh from Yards and Bill from Victory and, uh, you know, uh, Kurt uh, Decker. Uh, you know, I got so many great craft beer friends in, in Philly, but it's an industry that's not growing. Uh, it's what other industry has zero growth and a thousand new competitors entered it in the last year. That's what's happening in craft beer. So it is a competitive moment, but it, it'll be great for economic Darwinism. Consumers can now find good beer, and now it's going to be up to them to choose which breweries make quality, consistent, well-differentiated beer. The one thing that you were talking about at one point, Mariah, is how our taste buds have changed. And I remember when IPAs really hit the market, late 90s, you were overwhelmed by this hoppy smell and also taste. And now I don't feel like I get that anymore. Ha has IPAs or have IPAs changed our taste buds? Well, I know when um, 60 Minute, when we first started brewing 60 Minute, I was like, oh, that's too hoppy for me. And now, like, that's almost, I mean, it's not like water, but, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, totally used to that level of hop um, now. If I have a total, a very different kind of hopped beer, you know, I, you might get it right away. But I think you acclimate, like you acclimate to whether it's hot sauce or hops. So it's not physical; it's more of a a sense. I'm no scientist, but <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe it is. Maybe your taste buds do alter. That's a good. We should look into that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and by for scale wise, there's never been a single beer style in the 35 year history of the craft brewing movement that has truly, you know, made craft beer go from this niche little world into the mainstream. It's it was IPAs, like you said, in the late 90s, where you know IPAs really made craft beer approachable, interesting, understandable to the average American, not just beer geeks. Uh, so it's been a great sort of, uh, you know, gateway beer style that is now so big and prolific that it has sub-styles from session IPAs to New England style IPAs to Imperial IPAs. So it's fragmenting and getting more creative, which is a beautiful thing. I want to talk about the company and some of its origins, but the one thing that you resisted all along was you'd never really wanted to get into the private equity market. And I know back in, I think it was 2015, you did sell a 15% stake. Why did you suddenly resist that? So or not be able to resist. Yeah, I mean, Mariah and I have always had minority investors in our company. We've always had control and majority ownership, but we've always invited smart people in to invest in dogfish that we can learn from. And then they, you know, leave with the premium on their investment because they helped our company grow, whether it was her dad or uh, uh, my, my, the guy I built stone walls for, uh, uh, who, uh, uh, put money in to help me uh, start Dogfish. But we saw when things were getting super competitive four or five years ago and these foreign conglomerates were coming in and buying out what were once true craft breweries like Goose Island bought by Anheuser-Busch and uh, Terrapin bought by Miller Coors. Um, we knew our industry was now had these really sophisticated business people leading brands that the consumer perceived to be indie craft. And, and you needed to build a moat? We needed to build a moat around our brand and, and bring some small, smart minds. So, yeah, L&K, uh, we, we, they came in and bought 15.15% of our, our company four or five years ago, I guess. And they've been awesome thought pa pa partners. You know, they invested, they've been investors in Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, Ariette, which is a high-end equestrian brand. So they understand how to, how to help 
high-end brands navigate competitive moments in their industry without pressing the discount button because that's often what happens when sh- when stuff gets real. Uh, some brands, if there's no growth, go to discounting, and that no small brand can discount their way out of a competitive moment in their industry. Only the world's biggest conglomerates can live through that sort of pricing uh, strategy of, of discounting. You've had to mortgage your house over again to keep the company afloat a few times, right? <laughs> we I mean, did. you really had Back a personal in stake days. in this. Back <laughs> in the good old days, we, yeah, and we ate in the restaurant, so we didn't have to, like, go buy groceries <laughs> and hold, hold our paycheck so that we could pay cash, our coworkers. You know? <laughs> but, um, yes, but luckily that was, um, you know, it was a time where we didn't really have much of a house to lose. <laughs> <laughs> we had a rented house and two shitty used cars. <laughs> I want to talk about your beginning. You and I have a lot in common. We were talking about this earlier where we're, we both like beer. Yep. And we were English both, majors. both English majors. You went to Muhlenberg College. You're from Western Mass. Yep. Uh, but you went to Muhlenberg College. Yep. An, hour, an, an hour from right here. Sure. You uh, got an English degree. And you say you didn't even have a good beer until you went to graduate school. And so, of course, it makes total sense that you start one of the country's most respected <laughs> crab breweries, right? Yeah. Well, I'm not saying uh, I didn't drink a lot of beer before I had good beer. And uh, me at Muhlenberg and you at University of Delaware, I'm sure we still love beer back in that era, but we're probably a little de- less discerning. And yeah, right day after college, I moved to New York. I was taking some courses in writing at Columbia, and to pay my rent, I worked at a bar that just happened to be, I didn't know it when I applied for the job, like a first-generation hardcore craft beer bar run by a dude who was only like four years older than me who left the computing world to start a craft beer bar. So not only did I start getting into really good beer with him, learned that I had a good palate and I was pretty good at storytelling and, and, and conveying different types of beer to the customers. I really enjoyed that. But not only that, but I had this mentor who showed me he didn't have to use his college degree to, to do what he wanted with his life. Uh, so he and I started home brewing, and then from there I started writing a, a business plan, stopped going to uh, do, doing classes, and, and we opened Dogfish two years later. And you met during graduate school, was it? No, we, high went, school. we went in high, high school. school. Wow, yeah. going way yes. back. Yeah. So you always knew that Sam was going to be a great person. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, especially when I got kicked out of our high school. <laughs> Which did happen. Yeah, yeah. her parents were probably like, uh, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> what was he like in high school? He was not that much different than he is now. Oh, that's, that's good sweet. to hear, actually. Yes. He uh, had, a, had a good group of friends that were fun and um, maybe too much fun at some times, mm-hmm. <laughs> hence mm-hmm. getting kicked out of high school, but um, thoughtful. One great story is you are literally opening your first restaurant in Rehoboth Beach, and someone on a bike walk, goes by and he says, hey, you guys open up a craft brewery? That's against the law. Yep, yeah, yeah, Mariah, I think was there that day. We were taking the old sign off of the building, and she was taking a photo of us putting the new one. When we took the old sign off, there was another sign from another failed restaurant on the building we'd rented, and we were like, oh, crap, what are we getting ourselves into? And then a guy, <laughs> insult to injury, the guy comes by and goes, you know it's illegal, because when... Uh, when the government, federal government uh, repealed prohibition, th- that was just at a federal level. And then they left it up to every state to have to write their own laws to make it legal to brew in that state. And I didn't know that. And but, they just never bothered in Delaware. Because we were the first brewery since before prohibition to open in Delaware. So it shows you how cool. Uh, and you had Chris Coons on your show uh, and did a podcast. And he's a great uh, uh, evangelist for, for Delaware. Uh, but it, it, it showed you how great that. How, how, how great a state Delaware is, to, and to be in such a small state that's so business-friendly with that agriculture DNA and the DuPont DNA in our state, that when we heard that, I got my pickup truck, drove to Dover, and just asked around, hey, which one of these is the House, which is the Senate? Mr. Park- Caligione goes to Washington, <laughs> Dover edition. <laughs> Not exactly Washington, D.C., but they were kind of like, well, son, you got to write a bill. Come on in here. And, and we'll you help. did. And we, yeah, Mariah and I. And we, we've written, I think, five or six pieces of legislation, You know, some of, most of which were when we were still in our 20s. We didn't know what we were doing, but we just handwrite them, and then they'd put them into the system in Dover, and we'd stand on the floor and 
argue and present. And, and our state's been awesome on, on understanding the value, both from a tourist and tax perspective, to embrace the craft brewing community. And now there's probably 20 breweries in our state. Good thing you were an English major. You know how to write. <laughs> yeah, that helped. That helped, I think. There was one legislator who voted against the bill, that first original bill. Do you remember who that was? Man, Matt, you're, you're digging right. deep. You're oh, yeah. di- that's impressive. I don't remember who that was. No, but if you're listening out there, shame on you. Shame on you. <laughs> Either one of you jump in on this. Your book, where is it? It's right here. Over there. Oh, it's over there. Yeah, brewing up a I'm, business. Yeah, brewing up a business. I just want to get it because I want to hold it in my hand. You actually signed this for me way back, back in, in the, the day. day. Yeah. So there's a great story in here, one of my favorites. Um, you want to guess which one it is? The day I tried to get to Philadelphia and I blew up two trucks? No, oh. but that's a, that's like the second best one, in my opinion. Yeah. The, the, my favorite story is when you had an idea to promote dogfish by rowing across oh. the Delaware so Bay, which is highly dangerous because when you are in a little canoe, these big ships, that the carrier ships... They can't, like, hit the brakes. They just keep going. And if you're in the way, they will literally go over you. So just tell, tell the story of how you rode across yeah. from Delaware to New Jersey. Yeah. So uh, um, it, back in the mid-'90s when we opened Dogfish, we were the smallest brewery in the country. And we just started – built a little bit b- bigger brewery out of used cannery equipment. We were already selling in Philadelphia uh, by taking beers up to Copa 2 and Tom – uh, Peters, who now owns Monks, was the first guy to buy our beer at Copa too. So Philly was really our first city that we brought beer to. But soon after that, we knew we were going to open New Jersey. And I knew we didn't have much money for marketing. So in the quiet winter, I spent that winter hand building a, a wooden rowboat, like a sculling uh, sliding seat rowboat. And I was going to row the first keg from Delaware to New Jersey, you know, 17 nautical miles from Lewis to to New Jersey. As I went, the crow flies. As the crow flies, <laughs> or as the idiot rose. Uh, and uh, I went out and practiced it with the keg and promptly flipped, and the keg floated, you know, dropped to the bottom of the ocean. So I had to change all the posters to say, going to row the first six pack yeah, yeah. across Much to, lighter. to New Jersey, not the first keg. But then I sent the posters over to New Jersey, and I didn't do a good job of promoting it. Mariah was in a chase boat next to me with a walkie talkie just in case the ships came closer. Sure, sure. But I got over there, I got up on land, and and uh, I got in the bar, and the people didn't even know I was coming. The posters were just like dusty in a corner, all rolled up. The, you know, I had a warm six there was pack. One person there. Yeah, and it's a guy who owns Home Sweet Homebrew here in Philadelphia. George Hummel and his wife Nancy were the only people that showed up for the event. And I, we thought it was a horrible event, but he wrote a little story on it for Mid Atlantic Brewing News. That story was picked up by USA Today, and then uh, Levi's called me, and I got to do a, a, a shoot as a brewer with. With, uh, what's that famous Richard Avedon. Richard Avedon shot me pouring bo- beer into a glass that was in you know Rolling Stone New Yorker magazine and so that little stupid boat trip actually really helped us get a na- national recognition and was p- right a- around the era when our company started taking off and you're going alongside him in this canoe and what are you thinking as he's going through the water oh well I mean, I'm used to this insanity. I mean, he goes paddleboarding every day, even when it's snowing and wind advisories. So, um, yeah, I just, I mean, luckily we had a perfectly flat, calm day, and there was, there were no, we didn't have any issues with any ships coming in. So I just sat there and enjoyed the, enjoyed the ride. Mm-hmm. How do you do family time? Back to you know having a, a husband wife partner partnership. You have two children, teenagers. How do you make time? Well, you know, as teenagers, you can know that they really want to spend a lot of quality time with their parents. <laughs> Are you still cool in your 15-year-old daughter's no, eyes? That, that totally ended uncool. a long time ago. Yes. No, the, the most impactful family time that we, I think, have is um, when we, the four of us go on a trip somewhere. And they don't have a choice but to hang out with us. But they're great travelers. They love traveling. And so we went away at Christmas. We went on a ski trip. And they, you know, had a... 10 days with us and it was a really great time and oftentimes when we get to travel for work we will bring them so that they see that you know we we don't want them to put the weight of the world on their shoulders that someday either of them have to run dogfish just because we're a family company but we want them to be proud of what our family does and what what 
and understand what our family does. So we've gotten to do beer festivals in Italy and Australia that we've been able to, uh, places like that, and we get to bring our kids, and they get to see that our brand is known in these faraway places um, and that it's a fun world, that these entrepreneurs around the, the world uh, have a similar passion for trying to make their way in, the, in a marketplace that's dominated by these Goliath companies around the world, and we hope that they, they appreciate that when they, when they hang out at Dogfish and with our other coworkers, what we're trying to do. You have a lot of beers that are really high in alcohol content. Mm-hmm. Do you ever get criticized for that? People saying you know, it might lead to people drinking way too much, not realizing it, alcoholism even? I would say that we're very... Uh, when we do stronger beers, they're more done in the context of wine. So they're usually using exotic culinary ingredients. They're wine-like in their complexity, in their food compatibility. So they're not meant to be chugged. They're meant to be sipped and usually enjoyed in the context of a great meal, food. So we've never really had that issue. You know, that said, what we are seeing is, is you talk about the trend with IPAs. There's also definitely a trend of uh, more sessionable, lower alcohol beers. And we've really not only you know, in the 90s, we led with these bigger wine-like beers, but we've really been great, I, I feel, as a company in leading, the, you know, one of the, being one of the leaders in the sort of active lifestyle beer movement from Namaste, our yoga-themed Belgian white beer, to I'm um, drinking a, a sequench ale made with, uh, you know, Atlantic Ocean sea salts and limes. And this has actually become our, our fastest-growing sure. beer. Um, and it's only 4.9% alcohol, uh, but it's a thirst-quenching, great session beer. I think generally younger beer consumers that are just getting into craft now, opposed to the folks our age in the 90s, in general are looking for more sessionable beers than they are for higher ABV wine-like beers. I don't know what you'd add to that. No, yeah, I would agree. Then, And those big uh, big beers that we make, they're oftentimes shared. Um, you know, someone opens a bottle and everybody sh- shares a couple sure. sips. So it's more of an experience, like a, a culinary kind of experience than a, you know, going to set up six of those bottles and take them down in one night kind of situation. Now, when I was a young man in college learning how to, you know, read and critique the great works of the English language, I'm like, I got to figure out how to write the next great American novel. And I never figured it out. <laughs> and of course, you had your own ideas, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, we were talking about this before we started, uh, but, you, you know, you, you came from an English background with a, a journalism focus, and I think the, 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 the skill of writing and more generally the skill of storytelling is, I think, uh, applicable to any job that you have, and I think reading is the thing that hones your ability to storytell the best, so they're connected, a love of reading, I think, and a love of writing, and I, I could see when I was taking those classes at Columbia and their creative MFA program that I was a good writer in college in a little in a little pool like Muhlenberg I, I, I was sort of a standout I think writer but when I got to the show uh, up at Columbia where you know Kerouac and Ginsburg wrote I was like okay I'm just a good writer I'm not that's the big leagues right? <laughs> I was in the big leagues <laughs> and I was like all right I'm a good writer but I'm not a great writer you might strike out a few times here <laughs> and there right? <laughs> yeah so I was like all right well instead of trying to use my storytelling uh, love to write the uh, next great American novel. Maybe I can use my storytelling love to create recipes and stories around creative beer recipes and try to make the next great American beer seem more within my reach. And But I've been lucky that I've been able to also write a, a, a bunch sure. of books. Now there may be not... War and Peace or uh, Old Man the Sea. My kids give me crap because they say, Dad, you don't write books. You write uh, long lists of things you've done. <laughs> Your books are just long lists of things you've done. Sharing the journey and the things that you've done wrong. And Mariah, I did another book, book called Off-Centered Leadership more recently that I interviewed Mariah for, uh, a great uh, University of Pennsylvania professor, Stu Friedman. I interviewed him for it. So it's basically t- taking what you've learned and maybe try and make it into a format that other folks that are maybe in the same get interested in your industry uh, or, or your community are going to find some uh, inspiration from. I want to talk more deeply about that in a second, but real quick, favorite novel. <clears throat> Favorite novel, I reread Franny and Zoe every year, which is Salinger, the guy who wrote uh, Catcher in the Rye. Yes. Um, so you prefer that over Catcher in the Rye? I do. I do. It's kind of more existential and uh, hopeful. Uh, uh, so that's probably my favorite single book. How about you, Mariah? Right. 
uh, The Secret History by Donna Tart. And we finally got our son to read, yeah. read it. He fought us forever. We were just like, Sam, this is an amazing oh, book. And he's getting really a like teenager it. to read. Oh, no, like, he's a voracious. He's probably like trying reads, to build a yes. skyscraper. He reads more than Sam, I think. Yeah. Oh, that's son. great. I know. Mine is Old Man in the Sea, baby. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah I read that every couple of years, I too. Did, yeah. And I'm, it's I'm short. reading uh, The Sun Also Rises, like, on deck. Yeah. All right, you know, right book now. I'm reading right now. I'm going to read it next. Is this is The Old Man in the Sea, do you, is it the, your most reread book in your life, too? Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. Yep. I also, uh, I probably shouldn't say this. I reread American Psycho a couple times <laughs> by Brett Easton Ellis. Yeah. He, I'm, he's kind of like like People yeah. Magazine. Like if yeah. I want to go there, yeah. I read his stuff. Was his first big one Bright Lights, Big City? No, that was Jay McCann. His, his was less than zero. Yeah, that's right. Which that's was made right. into a movie, right. which was nothing yes. like the book, but yeah. Yeah, I digress. It never is. And same with American Beauty. Except with... for Harry Potter. That they did yeah, yeah, they did a very good job. <laughs> Little plug, because they need it. Harry Potter is worth checking out. <laughs> <laughs> what were your expectations at the ground floor of Dogfish Head? Not to go out of business. <laughs> Great motivation for any entrepreneur. Don't Get to this. there, yeah. Because you have three years in terms of the write-off for taxes, right? Well, actually, what I would say is the first year, so we opened, it was just, it was a, a restaurant with a little brewery in it. So the, the aspirations were to make enough money the first summer so that we could open the second summer because in the wintertime it's dead. It was dead in Rehoboth Beach. It's not anymore. But So it was just to make it to the next season yeah. for the first couple that of years. Low expectations. <laughs> that, was, that was our vision. Can we make it till next year? So right? did you find yourself say, well, every three years I'm going to reset my expectations? Or did you sort of just do it when it felt appropriate? Well, he reset goals. Long- Missives, I like the like Jerry Maguire, Maguire letters. <laughs> Dogfish Head will never get bigger than this, or Dogfish Head will never do. And we have one friend and coworker who has kept those. <laughs> Remember when you said this? And uh, yeah, so I would occasionally write these these Jerry Maguire letters about our, sort of our strategic plan and vision for our brand, and I got them so wrong that I just stopped writing them because you know we used to say. And we're still in the context of market share. We're tiny. I think we're one tenth of one percent market share in America. And to put that into context, uh, you know, Yingling, great indie American family-owned brewery from right here in Pennsylvania, will do I think around four million or no four uh, yeah no about uh, I think about two million barrels of beer. And for context, Dogfish will do about three hundred thousand. Uh, this year, um, so even in, in compared to a Boston beer, a Sam Adams, a Yingling, we're, we're we're tiny, but we're not tiny in the context of coastal Delaware. We are the largest craft brewery in the Mid Atlantic. We have 400 coworkers, so we're kind of a mid-sized company. But to, to your earlier question, it's bigger than our, we'd ever dreamed it would be. But it feels right because we haven't had to commodify what we do and just make one product or discount it. We've been able to flourish while still being more creative and more innovative today than we were when we were the smallest brewery in the, in the country. I guess the goals became not so much don't go out of business next year. It morphed into keep growing. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, but I mean, I get, you know, that kind of sounds, you know, sort of, weird (laughs) and not us i mean but we do have a goal to keep growing but it's mostly to remain relevant to our wholesale customers and to make give all the coworkers that work with us growth opportunities so we do say you know in our um leadership you know team at dogfish we say we want to grow every year um but we don't say it has to be you know 50 percent or 30 percent or you know we are reasonable in that. Um, you know, we had years where we did grow 50%, and we were outgrowing our, our people, our equipment, our processes way too fast. Um, and that would just was exhausting um, and not sustainable. So um, sustainable and smart growth is more okay. of what we'd like to shoot for. As a leader, are you a disciplinarian or a player's coach? Oh, uh, good question. Honestly, I'd say in, uh, I'm... I'm not a great people leader naturally i don't love to to be a manager of people i love to manage creative ideas and you know shepherd new beers to market and um so i would say i'm more of a uh, i guess more of a players coach because i'm not uh, in, He's definitely not the disciplinarian. No, I'm not the disciplinarian <laughs> in our house or at our company. I, I try to, uh, you know, I, I used to say I'd do the uh, the 
I'm a shunning model of people management. If somebody sucked, I just kind of ignored them <laughs> until hopefully they left the company, which isn't exactly great people management, right? So thankfully, we got folks like our, our, our president, George uh, Pastrana, who's a much more methodical people leader so that I can focus on creative stuff and be out representing our brand in the marketplace and coming up with new recipes, etc. while he's leading our VPs. But Mariah, myself, and George really lead the strategic planning of Dogfish. So we know, we have the humility to know what th- parts of running Dogfish we're good at and what parts we suck at. And then we try to entice people with those complementary skills to, to join our, our leadership uh, journey. I mean, the assumption is you have to be authoritarian, you have to be mean, you have to be tough. And in this case, Sam doesn't have to be any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> not that you're not tough, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, well, he can be tough in terms of driving ideas forward and, and focus. Persistence. Persistent. And, you know, if someone kind of gives some pushback, he'll find a way around, <laughs> you know. Um, so he's definitely tough in terms of um, moving moving forward something that he feels passionate about. And he feels passionate about a lot of things. <laughs> so sometimes that's Too a little much. overwhelming. <laughs> Since 1995, when the company was born, you've suffered through two major economic downturns. The first one, 2000, dot bomb, bust, and then 9-11, which exacerbated it. Mm-hmm. Then you have the 2008 economic collapse. What happens to craft beer buying during those periods? Yeah, it's, it's counterintuitive, Matt, because we, those were some of our biggest growth years. Now, granted, we were tiny, so it was easy to grow on a smaller base. But I think what's really great about craft beer is it's an affordable luxury. So at times when maybe people's belts are tightened and they can't afford a new SUV or a vacation house, they can afford the extra two bucks to treat themselves to a better six-pack of beer. So I think craft beer is 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 something that's approachable, uh, not just taste and flavor-wise, but in economically. It's not an expensive proposition to go high-end with your beer as it is with your watch or your car. Um, so we've been able to flourish during those more economically challenging moments. Going After going through that first economic downturn did you anticipate having that happen that second time you're like wow it, i mean it's not that it doesn't impact us but we can actually flourish at the same time i don't think we were that sort of looking at the big world at that time we were more sort of you know nose down just doing what we do within our company uh, i don't think we were so, sort of looking at the macroeconomic um you know world and, and deciding how it was going to impact us um we were too probably in the moment and in you know My insular. Office. You were working. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'd say honestly, what was been more what we've looked at more than the economic national economic cycles is just our industry and sort of the shakeout moment. So in the late '90s, too many breweries opened, and you know supply and demand got out of whack. And and breweries went out of business, and you know, including poor Henry's, Ortlieb's uh, yeah. brewery here. I was there for their opening. You were, yeah. and, and so we bought their their equipment from a bank, uh, and that's what helped us grow. Is uh, is when when certain breweries w- went went too big, and f- frankly, similarly, we're at sort of the precipice right now of another shakeout moment because it's a non growth industry, and yet two new breweries are opening every day. But there's not, you know, there's not more taps, there's not more restaurants, so consumers are going to have to choose. And really, you're now starting to get these uh, bu- these sort of bifurcated business models in craft beer. You're either a tiny brewery that sells your beer outside of restaurants and retail restaurants. You sell it directly to the consumer like an other half or tired hands closer to here. Um, And that's a great business model because it's economically strong. You don't have to give up 30% to a wholesaler and 30% to a retail. You keep 100% of the sale of your pint if you sell it across your own bar. Whereas a brewery like us, 95% of our sales go through the three-tier system, through distributors, through retailers, from our brewery to Riglio's Warehouse here in Philadelphia to Fergie's pub. Um, And so each of those components has to take a a share for their work. Uh, And so Dogfish, it's a a more economically challenging uh, model. So I do think in the next two years, you're going to see a lot of the top 500 breweries that rely on three-tier distribution be challenged to get through this this, uh, competitive moment. A couple more questions, and one of them is a bonus question. Oh, yes. We win, Mariah. Oh, yeah. You could win $100,000 right here. (laughs) Nice. You're getting a hat. I have $10 in my wallet. (laughs) There's this thing called hustle porn. Have you heard of this? And it's not about sex. No. 
So hustle porn is when people who are really hard workers 24 seven try to prove to everyone else how hard they work and they uh, share things on social media. Hey, look at me. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm never stopping. Do you think people work too hard these days? And I'm, this is, I'm talking to two people who work extremely hard to try and keep their business going. Is hustle porn a problem? Well, I'm guessing having just learned about hustle porn about 30 <laughs> seconds ago, <laughs> um, I'm guessing that the people that do that and the people that share that and talk about that are people who are passionate about what they're doing. Like whether it's the concept of hustling or they are doing something that they love doing. So they, you know, not only spend 23 hours a day doing it, but they want to tell the world about it through social media. So if they love that and they're, you know, it's motivating them. I don't know that that's a problem. I think if you have to work like 23 hours a day at a job you hate, first of all, you're not going to be posting on social media, sure. like in a <laughs> braggish way about it. But um, yeah, then that's a problem. If people are working too hard at jobs that they don't love and, and um, you know, I know a lot of people that are in that position, but you know, that's a problem. What do you think, Sam? Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think, in general, people in America probably work too many hours. When you go overseas and you see how relaxed and happy folks CS are, does. <laughs> taking their siestas, <laughs> three week vacations. Yeah. We we stop buying Italian, and I'm Italian by descent, and we stop buying Italian equipment because those people take the whole month of August <laughs> off. You can't get parts for your bottling line. It's kind of hot though. <laughs> So I think we can learn about work-life balance a little bit as a country. But to Mariah's point, if you're passionate about what you do, you know, Rob, Robert Frost had a, a, a poem where he talked about how, how lucky he was that his vocation was also his avocation, the thing that he loved to do. And when you have that good fortune where your job is something that you love and it's interesting to people and you want to share it, that's a pretty great opportunity. Okay, final question. And I hope you think it's good. I really try to figure – I like to end on like a real – Hammer. You're going to blow our minds. I don't know. Maybe I'm overselling it already. (laughs) What would happen if both of you were born in Prohibition days? Wow. We'd be making ice cream. (laughs) She'd be making ice cream in the vats that we built an illegal brewery for, and I'd be in jail. (laughs) You kind of are like Ernest Hemingway. (laughs) I would have punched Jay Fitzgerald and then gone to jail. Sam Caligione, the outlaw of ice cream. That's how Yingling made it through Prohibition. They opened it, they used their vats to make, uh, so shouts to everyone at Yingling for being creative <laughs> and getting through Prohibition to be America's oldest brewery. Yeah, they're, they're the, branded as such, the only one that kept it going, at least yep. as far as we know. Yeah, true story. Sam Caligioni and the original Mariah <laughs> Caligioni. Thanks for joining us on the True Philadelphia Podcast. This has been great fun, Matt. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Cheers. That was fun. Thanks to Sam. Thanks to Mariah. I must disclose, they gave me a can of beer to drink later. Music for this podcast by Walkabouts and Cliff Hillis. The songs were recorded in the legendary Hacienda Studio in Phoenixville. Executive producer Caroline Hayden. Thank you for listening to the True Philadelphia podcast. I hope you subscribe, tell your friends, and listen to some of our earlier episodes. I'm Matt O'Donnell. Stay true, Philadelphia.